Okay, everybody, we're going to go ahead and get started for this afternoon's webinar. Um, this afternoon, we're going to talk about um, household hazardous waste or hazardous waste at home, uh, different ways to identify and, <clears throat> excuse me, properly dispose of and manage hazardous materials at home. So thanks, everybody, for attending today. This is the, the third webinar in our series of four. Just as a reminder, next week is the last one. Um, same day, same time, and it will be on the potential hidden dangers of personal care products. Um, just a few housekeeping things before we get started. Um, if you have any questions as we're going through uh, the material today, please, please um, type them in the question box that you see in the webinar, in the webinar software, and we will uh, do our best to address those at the end. Um, this will be about a one-hour presentation followed by, you know, about 30 minutes for Q&A or discussion. Uh, we will be recording this webinar. We do plan to have it posted on our website. If you've been to our website, you'll see that the How Green Is Your Clean webinar, that was the first one that we did two weeks ago. That one's been posted, um, and our student is working on getting the, the one from last week on Safer Household Products up as well. So we hope to have these all all posted by the, the end of this month. And we will have a short survey sent out to all attendees um, of all the webinars after we do the, the final one next week. So be on the lookout for that in your inbox too. And just as a reminder, everybody's phones are muted. So even if you try to ask a question through the phone, it's not going to work. So please uh, be sure to use the question box that's in um, the webinar software. Okay, I think we are, we're set. We'll go ahead and get started. Um, my name is Kate Winnebeck. I am a Senior Environmental Health and Safety Specialist here at the New York State Pollution Prevention Institute, or we call it the P2I. Um, the P2I is a nonprofit organization. We're headquartered or, or housed at uh, RIT, Rochester Institute of Technology in Rochester, New York. So what we're gonna talk about today um, household waste, so identifying what really is household hazardous waste, uh, the different types of waste that you might encounter, and then the dangers and benefits of, of disposing it the right way and the wrong way. Um, so some of the waste types that we're going to look at are mercury, pharmaceutical waste, cleaners, um, pesticides, paint, and e-waste. We're going to look at those kind of in detail. Um, some alternatives to household hazardous waste, we'll go over some of those kind of quickly. So again, if you have specific questions, uh, I'm more than happy to, to discuss those at the end. And then household hazardous waste collection sites. <clears throat> so this series of webinars is based on a set of in-person workshops that we um, developed and delivered in New York State in 2012 through spring of 2014. And um, really the goal of the workshops, both the webinars and the in-person workshops, is to, is to improve our water quality and improve the water quality of the Great Lakes. So that's why here we see there are 30 areas of concern in the U.S. Great Lakes Basin. These are places where chemical contamination you know, has seriously endangered quality of life, um, either for people or the environment or both. In a lot of places you find um, both of these going on. So a lot of different, uh, a lot of places all throughout kind of the Great Lakes system, you see there's additional um, areas of concern on the Canadian side as well. So what is um, household hazardous waste? These are any, any products that can contain corrosive, toxic, ignitable, or reactive ingredients. Um, so kind of interesting, the average home, this is the average U.S. home, generates about 100 pounds of household hazardous waste every year, uh, which really is, is a lot. Um, that's why it's important that we manage it the correct way. So some label words to look for. Uh, if you're not sure if something is household hazardous waste or should it be, you know, not thrown in the trash, words like danger or poison uh, or caution or warning. You know, these, we know if they have those label words on them that they're either hazardous, highly toxic, uh, maybe it's, it's not quite as hazardous but still has some potential health or potential 
um, environmental issues associated with them, especially if they're not managed appropriately or managed um, in the correct way. So here's some examples of household hazardous waste. Um, so we have paint, paint-related products, uh, lawn and garden care products, so anything that's a pesticide or insecticide. You'll see there are fertilizers as well. Uh, beauty products and medicines, so a lot of your um, personal care products, especially things that are in aerosol cans, so like hairsprays or other hair products in those type of cans. Um, Alcohol-based lotions, nail polish remover, really anything that's that's not water-based. I mean, we're not talking about shampoos here. More things like nail polish, um, and some hair relaxers or like chemical hair treatments. Uh, hair dye may fall in this category as well. Um, household cleaners, you see pretty much every type of household cleaner is listed there. Automotive fluids, automotive batteries, um, and then kind of the, the miscellaneous catch-all. You know, anything that contains mercury, um, what else, some glues, other types of batteries, swimming pool chemicals, uh, anything anything that you might have that's, that's kind of out of the ordinary, if you will. And again, this is not meant to be a comprehensive list. It's more just some examples to kind of get everybody thinking about, you know, what might you have around your house um, that needs to be handled or, or managed differently than, than regular household trash. So some benefits of proper household hazardous waste disposal, you know, protecting children and pets from direct contact, um, preventing unexpected reactions and exposures that can harm solid waste handlers or your, your trash collectors and firefighters. So if we put, you know, hazardous materials in our garbage can and now uh, the garbage collector comes to pick it up, is he, he or she now being exposed to something um, that they wouldn't normally be exposed to? Or now do you have chemicals mixing that really shouldn't mix and have some reactions from that? Maintaining healthy soil bacteria, conserving freshwater systems, you know, so really protecting um, our water quality, so both uh, kind of lakes and streams and groundwater. If we don't have these materials out in the environment, if they aren't seeping into you know, our water, then, then we're protecting that. Same with food supplies. Um, and then, of course, protecting our bodies as well from kind of these these dangerous chemicals, dangerous poisons that we might have. So some of the dangers of improper disposal, you know, pouring things on the ground or into storm sewers. You know, storm sewers uh, typically drain directly into streams, lakes, groundwater. So all that water that goes into your storm sewer does not go to a water treatment plant. Um, many people don't realize that. Um, so anything that just goes down your storm sewer goes directly into uh, a lake or a stream um, or the groundwater. And then, of course, th that waterway then becomes polluted with whatever chemicals that were in there. Um, if you pour chemicals down the drain, again, depending on the types of chemicals they are, um, can contaminate septic tanks or wastewater treatment systems. They can actually throw off the balance um, in wastewater treatment systems. Um, and, and cause real havoc on, on water treatment systems. Um, dumping things in the trash, you know, in New York, I know that there's more than 100,000 tons of household hazardous waste are put in the trash every year, so that's waste that should really be managed as household hazardous waste and is not. Um, so when we do that, again, potential to cause injury to sanitation workers, um, when it goes to a landfill, you know, you have that leachate that comes out of the landfill as materials are, are breaking down, um, which needs to be treated, and now if that's being treated with some, some more hazardous chemicals to it. Uh, and then incinerators, you know, some trash that gets collected goes to an incinerator instead of a landfill. So you have um, emissions that can contaminate air um, and have ash residues that could have heavy metals or could have, you know, some other hazardous materials in them from these household hazardous wastes. And then just a simple thing of where they're stored, how we're storing them around our house, uh, if there's, you know, special hazards to children or pets, if 
they're stored in a place where they can easily get to them, um, then of course they can, just like any other hazardous chemical, you know, present some kind of hazard to, to children. So now going into kind of specifically, you know, what do we consider household hazardous waste and what are typically considered household hazardous waste? We have paints and paint thinners. Um, latex and oil-based paints are the two most common uh, paints that you find. You know, latex made before 1990 can contain mercury. Um, older paints, you know, made before 1978, hopefully nobody has cans of those hanging around at home, uh, might contain lead, maybe uh, have some lead in them, be lead-based paints. Um, Let's see, oil-based paints, those typically contain some solvents. Um, and then hobby or artist paints, you know, are very different from like latex paint we use in our, our home to paint our walls. Uh, so they can usually contain some solvents. They can contain heavy metals as colorants in the paints. Um, any kind of aerosol, so spray paints, um, can contain solvents and propellants in them as well. And then thinners, strippers, um, other solvents, you know, you can, can read the list there, what that covers. Uh, most of these are flammable, you know, not, so some things you can do even if you are using them, but not, not eating, drinking, smoking near them, trying to use water-based products, trying to use latex um, paints as much as possible, as much as you can. Um, if you have waste paints, one thing to consider or kind of, you know, paint you're not going to use is donating them to local schools, local theater groups, uh, other, you know, nonprofit organizations that might use them. A lot of times schools, especially if, if they have um, like a school musical or a school play, they would probably love to accept your um, latex paint that they can then use in their their production. Um, some communities do recycle latex paint, so that's one thing you can look into if you have kind of a, a larger quantity of paint. You know, sometimes you, you paint a room and end up with three quarters of a gallon left. So again, if you can't donate it, you might be able to recycle it. If you have um, latex paint, if you have a, a can of latex paint and that's less than half full that you want to get rid of, um, you can dry it out, just leave it with the lid off um, in a place where obviously children and pets aren't going to get, you know, in contact with it. Let it air dry, or you can mix an absorbent with it, something like a, a kitty litter or sawdust. Um, let it totally dry out so it's, it's hard, and then throw that in the trash can just with your, your regular trash. If you have more than kind of half a gallon, of um, latex paint and you can't donate it, you can't get rid of it, then um, take it to your, your household hazardous waste collection center. We'll talk about those at the end too. <clears throat> um, indoor pesticides, um, a lot of these we see, you know, insecticides, um, disinfectants, so we kind of talked about some disinfectants in the How Green Is Your Clean um, webinar. But there are some alternatives that you can use, uh, especially like for house plants. If you have plants that have um, that have small bugs around them, you can spray those with warm soapy water and rinse them well. Uh, to disinfect, you can use um, borax and water. I've heard of others. I know many others that use vinegar um, to disinfect. Um, and kind of interesting that 80% of most of our exposure to pesticides actually happens indoors as opposed to outdoors. We tend to think of pesticides as kind of an outdoor um, lawn care type thing, but really a lot of it happens inside. So, you know, any kind of pesticide, so anything that says it's, it's designed to kill something uh, is going to be toxic, you know, probably not biodegradable and should be managed as as household hazardous waste. Um, very similar for outdoor pesticides. Um, so anything that is a weed killer, any herbicides that you might have, um, anything, any swimming pool chemicals, any repellents. Uh, sometimes you can find some more 
Um, natural repellents, we have a deer problem in our house. So I was able to find something that used, I believe it has cinnamon and cayenne pepper in it. Um, so you can find some more natural repellents. It doesn't smell very nice, but I'm sure that's why the deer don't like it. Um, yeah, so there are some alternatives that you can do too. And then for pesticides, so if you have empty containers of pesticides, you want to uh, triple rinse those containers. So rinse them three different three times, clean water every time. Um, save the rinse water and use the rinse water itself as the pest as a pesticide too. And then discard those empty containers in the trash. And then household cleaners. Uh, I'm gonna you know refer. I'm going to talk kind of uh, um, generally about household cleaners. If you want to get some more information, please go back and look at our How Green Is Your Clean um, webinar that we did. The recording, as I mentioned, is up on our website, and we'll have the slides up very soon as well in the next week or so. Um, but kind of generally speaking, you know, products that are normally flushed down the drain during use, so things like um, dish soap or... What else? Maybe some tub and tile cleaners, um, things that you're going to kind of flush and, and rinse with water can usually be disposed of by pouring down the drain very slowly with the water running. So you don't want to just dump, you know, a whole um, bottle of something down. You want to make sure that water is running with it. It's very diluted. If you have anything that's toxic, corrosive, you're unsure, you know, don't pour it down the drain. Then take it to your household hazardous waste. Um, collection and, and they'll kind of advise you on what to do. So some some of those, you know, oven cleaners, drain cleaners, um, some bathroom cleaners, maybe some toilet bowl cleaners, those are kind of the, the most toxic or most corrosive. Um, so those you definitely don't want to put um, down, just flush them down the drain. Same thing with metal um, polishes, wood polishes, waxes. So things for like a stainless steel cleaner or um, like spray wood polishes. Those are all solvent based and so you don't want to put those down um, the sink either. And you don't want to just put those in your trash. So take those as, as household hazardous waste. And just, you know, uh, I'm sure many of you have seen posters similar to the one that's here, um, but this was the Healthy Homes program here in Rochester at the University of Rochester and they kind of compared or contrasted you know look at this cleaning product and then here's a food product and how easy it is for children to get them mixed up and that's why you see um, that a lot of poisonings that are reported to the poison control centers really are um, children getting into these cleaning products and, and children kind of ingesting them because they look like food. You know, it's really hard to tell the difference when you look at the containers side by side. So making sure to store um, cleaning products, store all your household hazardous waste, you know, out of the way, out of view of a child, um, out of reach of a child as well. It's really important. So here are some common ingredients of concern that you might find in um, household products and household cleaners. So really any products that have these ingredients uh, should be managed, should be disposed of as household hazardous waste. Um, so you see things like bleach, um, ammonia, you know, those are very common. Hydrochloric acid you may find in oven or drain cleaners, um, perchloroethylene, that you might find in carpet cleaners or spot cleaners, like uh, um, spot cleaners for furniture, uh, you might find in there. You know, being careful not to mix bleach and ammonia, bleach and acids, um, or using two drain cleaners together or one right after the other, because you might have one that's bleach based um, and one that's acid based and not know it, and now you've mixed them together and kind of created. Um, toxic gases. Um, aerosol inhalers and aerosol containers. Um, 
they can either be disposed of as a solid waste or recycled. It's going to depend on, on your municipality a little bit. Um, aerosol containers can explode under heat or pressure. Um, so these are things like, like spray um, air fresheners, right? We talk about aerosol containers or hair, a lot of hairspray um, or, or other hair products you still find in aerosol containers. Even things like um, non-stick cooking spray you can find in aerosol containers. Um, so some alternatives, you know, using pump sprays instead. So when you're actually selecting your product to buy, choosing one that comes in a pump spray instead of in an aerosol um, container, using baking soda instead of using air fresheners, um, or using maybe a different type, if you're somebody that's totally sold on air fresheners, you know, using a different type of air freshener that doesn't involve an aerosol um, container as well. That's another thing you could do. And then automotive chemicals. Uh, we have antifreeze, brake fluid, motor oil. Um, so all of these should be disposed of or taken to your household hazardous waste um, collection center. You know, a lot of times they will actually recycle them there, so you're not necessarily taking them to be disposed of, but you're bringing them back, they'll collect them, and then they'll recycle them for them to be um, used again. So in terms of like antifreeze, and I know um, motor oil, you can check with local uh, auto garages, public work, salvage yards, um, to see if they'll take your, your waste materials as well, because they're recycling their materials and they might collect yours also. Um, if they won't, or if you don't want to go that route, again, you can uh, take it to your household hazardous waste collector. And then batteries. Uh, so automotive batteries you know, contain sulfuric acid and lead. Um, that's why we have such a great um, recycling system in this country to, to get back um, automotive batteries. So improper disposal is prohibited by most state law. Like I know here in New York, when you buy it or you get a new car battery, um, you return the old one. So they take it back and then they recycle it for you. Um, household batteries. So if you think about your single use alkaline batteries, your double A's, triple A's, D's, etc. Those can typically be disposed of in the trash. Some recyclers will accept them, will take them back. Um, I've seen very few, at least around us, that will actually take them. Usually they just go in the trash. Any small button batteries that you have might contain mercury, silver, or lithium, and they'll usually be marked. They will be marked, especially if they have lithium um, in them. You know, don't throw those in the trash. Take those to, to uh, household hazardous waste. Same thing with rechargeable batteries. They often contain, they're often NICAD, so they contain nickel, cadmium. Um, and then you can check with your, your state environmental department because it changes kind of state by state um, to see if retailers are required to accept them back from recycling and if they are, kind of who will take them back. Um, otherwise, I would, you know, check with your or local household hazardous waste. They should be able to take them for you. Um, products containing mercury. So anything that you know or you might kind of guess contains mercury um, must be managed as a, a hazardous waste or the household hazardous waste. Um, many will collect them, will accept them. They do require special handling, special packaging you know, to reduce both the human and environmental risks, especially when you get into things like um, CFLs, that if they're broken, now you've released mercury vapor in the air, now you've released the mercury from it. Um, so make sure that you're handling those appropriately. Typically, I mean, there's a list of products here that might contain mercury. The most common things you find, again, compact fluorescent light bulbs, CFLs, um, older thermometers, older thermostats that still contain some mercury in them, uh, very few batteries, you find those as well.
And then pharmaceutical waste. Um, so when we talk about pharmaceutical waste and kind of the correct way to um, manage it, what we're really talking about are prescription drugs, so these could be controlled, so DEA controlled substances or non-controlled substances, um, over-the-counter medications, veterinary medications, and vitamins and nutritional supplements. And it's really important to um, make sure that we're, we're managing those in the appropriate way so we can reduce pollution of our water, pollution of the environment, you know, diversion and drug abuse. Um, that's, that's kind of a hot topic now. It's very much on the rise, especially among teenagers and kind of high school kids, um, getting into medicine cabinets and, and stealing drugs and taking them to school. And then accidental poisonings at home as well. So some medications of particular concern. Um, this is particular concern, you know, in, once they get into the environment. Uh, hormones and endocrine disrupting substances. So think about things like birth control pills or, or fertility um, treatments. Antibiotics, painkillers, depressants, um, stimulants to treat uh, ADHD or um, ADD, attention deficit disorder, over-the-counter cough suppressants um, as well. So those are kind of the, the main ones of concern. Um, so, so it used to be that everybody flushed their waste medication down the, down the drain or down the toilet. You know, that was kind of the thing that you're supposed to do. Everybody was taught to flush. Um, we still find that there are some nursing homes, some other facilities that that's still what they do and really trying to educate people that that's not, um, the appropriate thing to do anymore. You know, we now know that, um, these chemicals end up going directly to our waterways. We're finding flush medications in lakes, rivers, and streams. Um, the EPA currently considers medications in drinking water to be a contaminant of emerging concern. Uh, in 2008, medications were found in the drinking water of 24 major metropolitan areas that serve 41 million people. And then in 2010, a study was done and found drugs in Michigan drinking water. And the, the drugs they found, um, atenolol, that's a heart medication, estrogen, um, sulfamexobazole, that's an antibiotic, um, an anxiety medication, and an anti-epileptic drug. So we're finding all kinds of, of different drugs actually ending up in the water because we're we're flushing them down the toilet. So the big concern, you know, they go, so we flush them down the toilet, they go to local water treatment, um, and the water treatment plant can't remove these contaminants, we don't have the technology in place to remove them, and they end up discharged to the environment, so they end up, you know, in our lakes, and our waters, and our streams. Um, and then medication that goes in the trash, so if you say, well, could we just put it in the garbage instead, goes to the landfill, the water that's collected, so that leachate, again, that comes off the landfill, and goes to the local water treatment plant, you kind of have the same cycle. So now the water treatment plant is trying to treat the medications in the leachate, which it can't do, um, so you still kind of have um, the medications ending up in our water. And then we, we're seeing adverse effects on fish. So we're seeing decreased reproduction rates. We're seeing um, feminization, <coughs> excuse me, of male fish, development rates that are slower. And then there's kind of this question around um, how indicative is that um, to effects on humans? Are we going to start seeing the same types of effects? How long until we see those effects? At what level do we have to find pharmaceuticals until we see those effects? Um, Etc. So right now there's there's a lot of concerns. We just don't know uh, what those long-term effects really are going to be. So the best thing to do: uh, take any waste medication that you have to a local or regional collection event. So you can check with your local environmental department, your local household hazardous waste department, or household hazardous waste facility. Um, or police departments. A lot of police departments will have um, collections. You can 
check with them to see when they're going to have collection events. Uh, some municipalities will have, you know, regular collections, so Monday through Friday for, at a certain time you can take them. Others, it might be one day a month or, you know, one day a week. Um, so you can check and see how uh, that works in your area. And it's not possible if you don't have a place to take them or if you don't want to leave them in your home. Um, place them in the trash after making it unrecognizable. So the next, the next slide kind of talks about that. So some other things that you can do, you know, to prevent generating all this waste, even in the beginning, is um, get sample packs from your doctor. So if you're going on a new medication, if it's something that you haven't taken before, ask your doctor if you can get a sample before you go and get, you know, a, a big um, prescription if you're not sure if you will respond to it appropriately. And then only buying the amount that you'll need and will actually use. So think about that for over-the-counter medications, um, over the or uh, excuse me, vitamins and supplements as well. You know, it's great to save some money by buying the 200 pack of of ibuprofen, but if you're not going to actually take all 200 of those pills before they expire, uh, then really it's just kind of creating some waste when it doesn't doesn't need to be there. So disposal at home, so if you want to put it in the trash, again, this is kind of a, a last uh, last on the, the totem pole, if you will. It's, it's definitely preferable to take it to a, a collection event where they will manage it appropriately. Um, but add something undesirable, like coffee grounds, cat litter, dirt, etc., cetera, um, to the waste medication that you have. You know, mix it up. So you want to kind of mix it so it makes it undesirable both for any wildlife, any people um, that could be getting into your garbage. And then put them in a container, seal the container with tape, and then put them in your, your trash. You know, make sure that uh, the appropriate people are handling medication. And I know there's some a medication that women shouldn't handle, men shouldn't handle, pregnant women shouldn't handle, etc. So just kind of be cognizant of that as you're, you're handling medication. And then if you have any medications that are administered with um, a needle or any kind of sharp, you know, place those in a puncture-proof container, seal them up with tape, label them as sharps. Um, some hospitals have household sharps collection programs. Like I know here in New York, um, you can take your household sharps to any hospital and they have to accept them and dispose of them free of charge for you. So there are some um, state hospital programs that will do that too. So check, um, you can check with your state environmental agency. They should have information on that for you. And same thing for the original plastic containers. So the, the little plastic, um, plastic containers that your prescription drugs come in or that over-the-counter drugs come in, um, might be recyclable in your blue bin. Um, you'll have to check with your waste hauler to see if they will accept those as well. And then electronic waste. Um, so electronic waste, you know, con computers, TVs, VCRs, if anybody has those hanging around anymore, uh, copiers, fax machines, cell phones, um, any kind of you know small device, some kids' toys uh, fall under this. If you have toy pianos, um, anything that makes noise, lights up, runs on batteries, um, is considered electronic waste. So right now, Americans own about 24 electronic devices per household, uh, which which kind of seems like a lot to really think about it when we start. Then you start adding up TVs and computers and smartphones and tablets and, and all these devices, it's, it's a lot. Um, in 2005, about 26 to 37 million computers were um, obsolete, and then that resulted, or excuse me, and then 304 million um, different electronics were removed from U.S. households. So that's just computers in 2005. About two-thirds of those still work still function. 
So that means we're actually getting rid of, um, you know, two-thirds of our, our stuff that still is perfectly fine and, and, and still works, which is kind of a shame. And then of those 304 million electronics, that was 1.9, about 2 million tons um, of waste. That's what that, that translates to. And of that, about 1.8 million tons was landfilled. So that, that was kind of surprising to me. I've, I've always kind of thought of e-waste as being something that's pretty well managed in this country and, and that a lot of people recycle. So that was kind of interesting to me to see that, that it's actually a very small percentage um, of electronic waste that's actually managed appropriately and recycled appropriately. Um, so the, the challenge or, or the concern with e-waste and electronic waste, things like lead, mercury, cadmium, um, that you find in, you know, electronic equipment that can be released into the environment. Even things like flame retardants you find in, in um, e-waste can be released. Um, so if you're interested in recycling your e-waste, um, you can go to the EPA's Electronics Donation and Recycling page, and the link is there. Um, and you can find which products specific manufacturers and retailers will accept for recycling. So you can go on and you can look up either by retailer or by, by device, and you can see who uh, will accept what and does this cost anything, you know, uh, depending on, on where you are as well. So it's kind of a, a nice tool to go in and see. And my own personal experience has been if I go into a store and ask them, um, if they accept things or not, generally the people in there um, can answer my questions and, and can answer them intelligently. So I've had great experience returning, or I should say recycling, uh, some electronics waste at, at stores specifically. I mean, most recently we had a, a old microwave that we took to Best Buy. We have no idea where we bought it. It's very old, um, but Best Buy took it back for us, no questions asked. So that was really great, and no cost to us. <clears throat> so some things that you can do uh, to reduce kind of your, your generation of household hazardous waste. So if we can kind of reduce or prevent this waste in the beginning, that's, that's of course, the best thing, that we don't have waste that we need to manage. Um, you know, using non-hazardous or less hazardous products, so evaluating products when you're buying them, uh, reducing the amount and or toxicity of the products that you use or products that you buy. So only buying, only using the amount that you actually need. You know, not buying uh, a jumbo size of something simply because it's a couple cents or a dollar cheaper, but really buying the, the amount that you'll actually use or at, actually need. And then sharing materials. So do you have um, things that haven't expired, you know, make sure this, the product can still safely be used, sharing it with neighbors, friends, relatives, donating it to businesses um, or charities, like I mentioned, the surplus paint, um, swap or donate at organized waste exchange events. You know, there are some municipalities that set up those events so you can actually take your, your waste or take your old products and, and kind of trade with others. And then just some reminders um, for household hazardous waste and, and kind of storing it correctly. You know, never storing anything hazardous in any type of food container. Um, keeping them in original containers and not removing labels. This is, you know, anything that's hazardous. Um, except if you have any kind of corroding container. If you have something that's corroding, repackage it, clearly label it, make sure it's in um, a package that can't easily be opened, so you're you're not going to have children or pets or other animals that can accidentally get into it, or it's not going to easily open so that, you know, now when you have sanitation workers um, um, collecting it, or even the household hazardous waste people kind of collecting it, then, then you don't have issues with them being exposed to it. No. Not mixing household hazardous waste with other products, either with other household hazardous waste, with other non-hazardous waste, 
Um, if you have things that are incompatible, then you can have, of course, reactions. Um, or if you have products that are not household hazardous waste and you mix household hazardous waste with them, now um, the whole solution is you know, unrecyclable. Now the whole solution is something that, that has to be disposed of as a household hazardous waste. And then storing things in an out-of-the-way location. So away from, from heat, away from children, away from pets, um, away from really where anybody could get into it or, or kind of want to get into it. So collection and disposal facilities, and typically local municipalities will have a dedicated kind of household hazardous waste facility or dedicated collection dates throughout the year. And it's going to depend, I found, on kind of the size of your municipality, if you're a larger town. Um, for example, here in Rochester, we have the Monroe County Eco Park. Um, so you can go online, you can set up a time to go and drop off your waste. They have a list of here's everything that they accept, here's everything that's free, here's everything that might have a charge. Um, they charge here in Rochester, they charge for items that contain Freon. So if you have um, old appliances that you want to get rid of, um, a dehumidifier, for example, that might contain Freon, you know, there, there's going to be a, a small charge for that to handle um, the Freon. And they may charge for appliances here, too. No, I don't totally remember. Um, but then there are some smaller municipalities, for example, I know up in um, Messina, St. Lawrence County area, um, when you get kind of the smaller population, they have more dedicated collection dates. So, so they'll have a couple dates during the year. Um, so they'll have those scheduled and have a time and a place where people can take their household hazardous waste and drop them off um, for, for collection. So really it's checking with your local environmental services department, local governments, um, to see when and where can you drop things off, um, how much can you drop off, um, what the times are. And same thing for um, pharmaceutical collections. You know, a lot of household hazardous waste facilities will also take pharmaceuticals, but that's a question to ask them. Um, some police stations, like I mentioned, will take them. And the reason why um, police stations will take them is because there might be some, um, some DEA drugs that get brought back. So some DEA controlled substances, so there needs to be a, a police officer there when the drugs are being dropped off. That's why you can't just kind of, ho anybody can't host a pharmaceutical collection because you have to have um, um, law enforcement there to ensure that, that the drugs are collected and, and kind of managed appropriately, you know, that no one's stealing them. Um, but that's something to check in with too. I know they're around here in Rochester, the, the Monroe County Eco Park, they have certain days of the month uh, where they do pharmaceutical collections, but then kind of the, the suburbs around the greater Rochester area, a lot of the police stations, um, whether it's once a month or every other month, will have a day where they have a pharmaceutical collection too. So it really ranges a lot, again, depending on your municipality, the size of your, your municipality. Um, so that's really something to, to check in locally and see how uh, your municipality works and how they, they kind of do it for you. Okay, so that is the end of today's presentation. Um, another reminder that our 